Greg Berhalter has made me do something that I never thought I would do. We did not have a plan B. We should have had a plan B. Where did the whole thing of the behind the back pass? Enough of Aaron Long. Berhalter bounce. Yeah. Where, where did that come from? Right, so if it's coming out of bounds there, it's, it's something like that. Oh, wow. Right. This window has been absolutely shambolic. But we have to seriously acknowledge how much he's holding this team back. One question I've been getting a lot is why, why, do, why does he do behind the back pass? Where is the belief in this system? Where is the common sense? This is amazing, by the way. <laughs> Where is this? This is great. And he just, you know, tells us that the sky is red when the sky is clearly blue. He really thinks that this system is that important that players like that, like Brooks, like Green, um, like PFOC, don't belong simply because his system is more important than bringing the best players. You were a target. Right? If things don't go correctly, people have got a lot to say. Thanks for clicking the video. If this is your first time on the channel, then hello, I'm Lou. And here at Football Moments, we typically just like to have some fun and make light-hearted banter content. But if you couldn't tell by the intro, something snapped in me over the course of this past international break. The US men's national team got our cheeks clapped in. And this behind-the-back bounce pass merchant is the root cause of it all. From the nepotism that got him his job, to the marriage to his system, and to his arrogance as a head coach. Coach. This fraudulent individual has committed crimes against the national team, which cannot be forgiven. So sit back, relax, get a bag of popcorn, and express your anger vicariously through me. As I detail in length the absolute football terrorism that this individual has brought upon our nation. And as I do, like the video, leave a comment on the video, and hit subscribe. All of those things are free for you to do and actually do a lot in helping get this video out to more people. So if you hate this fraud as much as I do, then join the movement and let's begin. So how did a manager whose CV consists solely of getting sacked from a second division Swedish team and finishing fourth in the MLS somehow land a job as the national team head coach? Because he was hired by his brother, of course. Yep, it's true. Lord Gregorius Berhaltis was crowned in December of 2018. And while technically it was the general manager of the US Soccer Federation, Ernie Stewart, who hired him, Ernie Stewart had only been in the job a couple of months. We were without a head coach for over a calendar year, and Jay Burhalter, Greg's brother, heavily campaigned to get Ernie Stewart the job. Jay at the time was the CFO, so that's basically the second in command at the US Soccer Federation. The hiring process in the search for the national team head coach consisted of only two interviews with candidates for the position. Yeah, not exactly the extensive hiring process that they claimed it was in Lord Gregory's coronation statement. And it's not like nobody wanted the job. Managers like David Moyes and Julian Lopetegui both were vocal about wanting the job and reached out to the Federation. And they both said, 
that they never even received a phone call back. Even an American candidate in Jesse Marsh said that the Federation didn't even contact him. Uh, real quick, I just want to highlight the ridiculousness in ignoring Le Petagui, who oversaw one of the greatest undefeated runs in national team history while coaching Spain. That's like being a 4 and leaving a 10 on Reed in the DMs. Because of the conflicting financial interests that the Federation has in the MLS due to an organization called SUM, Soccer United Marketing, the better the MLS does, and the more marketable the MLS is, the more money gets given to the Federation. So the Federation has a financial incentive in hiring a head coach that they know is going to give more chances to domestic players. And so when you begin to finally realize that, and realize that Jay Burhalter went from being the second in command at US Soccer Federation to executive vice president of the MLS, the conflict of interest in him hiring his brother begins to make you a little sick to your stomach. Only a year ago, the relationship between US USSF and Zoom was finally cut, but remember Greg was hired four years ago, so my criticisms of this relationship are more than valid. Now that I think about it, maybe Jay Burhalter wasn't lying when he said all he handles is the financial aspects of the game. He could very well consider the hiring of the head coach a key element in that. And if you think I'm a conspiracy theorist, if you think that there's no problems with nepotism in US soccer, then don't take my word for it. Take the word of US soccer. They had a group of employees that were so fed up with how the Federation was being run that they went to the New York Times with an expose saying this. We are okay with nepotism here, one review said, mentioning both Burhalters by name. Executives are more interested in what benefits them rather than making soccer the preeminent sport in America. At this point, not thinking that Greg was an underqualified fraud hired by his brother is way more of a conspiracy theory than thinking that he was. <laughs> Now, Lord Gregory is a strong believer in the principles of positional play, kind of like how Manchester City play. He is an ideologue in that fashion and wants the US always playing a high line while adhering to those philosophies, mainly utilizing a 4-3-3. The only problem with this is, uh, we don't have the players to do that, and our best players all thrive in other systems. It's not that we have bad players, but ask yourself, why doesn't every team just play like Manchester City? It's because most teams don't have the players to play like that. It's not easy to coach a team on the principles of positional play at the club level where you're interacting with them almost every single day. And so at the international level where you only interact with the group a week at a time, it's basically impossible to have a system like this. So why are we forcing ourselves to play like this at the national team level? It's just trying to fit a square peg into a round hole. I mean, we got Tim Ream captaining an in-form Premier League Fulham side. Eh, ignore him. He doesn't fit Greg's system and he doesn't play a high line well. We have John Brooks coming off of a great year at Wolfsburg who actually has good World Cup experience. Eh, ignored by Greg. He doesn't fit the system. He just can't play a high line. Greg, if our two most experienced and our two most proven center backs can't play in your system, then why are we using the system? And instead, in the place of those two guys, we've got got the American Harry Maguire, Aaron Long, instead. There is zero reason for this walking low light reel to have started every single game that we have played since we qualified for the World Cup. That alone is a sackable offense. Actually though, to be fair to Greg, it's not just Brooks not being able to play a high line that he cites for reasons for icing him out of the team. He actually cites a bunch of reasons. Just just give me a minute here. I need to go, I need to consult the sacred texts to explain this John Brooks situation. <coughs> last November, he said a lot of it was based on how we felt his performance was with the team. The last time he's been performing, he's working his way back into form. It's just about regaining your form and performing at a high level when you get the opportunity. So he's just gotta regain his form. Then after he leaves him out of the January window, he said there's absolutely nothing wrong with the form of John. He wouldn't be the best fit for this particular window. We're hoping that he regains his form for Wolfsburg and they start winning games and move themselves up the table. You know, let's, let's not take the piss here. I, I certainly wasn't. Well, I think you are. So in the span of two sentences, he said he needs to work on his form and he's back in form. So let's see what he said in March. There's some details in his game that I talked to him that we need to improve to fit into our game model. We don't have time on Tuesday to improve these things. Very false. Very, oh, very false. True. No, no, no. Ooh. Very, very false. It's so false. 
He's very bad. Okay, so in March, it's no longer about form. Now it's all about not fitting into the system. And after leaving him out in May, he said, I would rather look at a guy like Carter Vickers to see what he can do because I know what John can do. So to make the long story short, we all believe that John Brooks is sleeping with Greg's daughter. It's just all that makes sense. At some point though, you really do have to ask, what is it that's keeping our most experienced European players and leaders out of the team? Is it because Greg wants more control of the locker room? Is it because of the rumored MLS quota that was cited in Cruyff's autobiography? Is it because we need MLS players due to the financial relationship between the USSF and the MLS? No one really knows exactly what it is. But I do believe that you're a bit of an idiot if you believe the explanations that old Greg gives us. Hey, he Maybe he just keeps picking so many trash MLS players because he thinks this is like FIFA Ultimate Team. He's just trying to get as many green chemistry lines as possible. And anyways, by just picking players to fit one system, he leaves us so tactically inflexible. Are we really gonna show up to the World Cup and only play one way? We're gonna have the same approach against Iran and Wales as we do England? Tactically speaking, Lord Gregory has the flexibility of Stephen Hawking. In our most recent friendly against Japan, he just sat there and watched as we got pressed into oblivion for 45 minutes and didn't make any tactical changes until half. We are getting smashed, Greg. Greg, why don't you change the tactics, Greg? Your system sucks, Greg. It's not working, Greg. Just tell the midfield to play deeper, Greg. These center backs can't do this. They need help, Greg. Greg, why won't you help them, Greg? The US men's national team has tons of young, talented players playing at big clubs in Europe. Reyna, Pulisic, Aronson, McKenney, Dest, Weya, Musa. But we're wasting away this golden generation on a fraudulent manager. So far, we have faced seven opponents that are going to the World Cup, and we've only scored against one of them, that being Morocco. We only have five road wins since Greg was hired. Someone tell him that this World Cup isn't the home World Cup, it's the next one. And I can only pray to God that he is not going to be around for that one. <laughs> Now the key trait that Burhalter encapsulates that brings all of this together is arrogance. And it's through this arrogance that we see some of his most ridiculous decisions and bizarre quotes. Got spanked by Canada 2-0 for the first time in decades? Greg thinks we dominated the game. The fact that you would say dominant, I'm just looking at him right now. You got shut out two to nothing for crying out loud. I'm looking at him and I'm saying to myself, why is he the coach of this team? Am I being a bit overzealous? Am I being a bit unfair in questioning that right now when I look at a man that got shut out and wants to applaud his team for doing such a great job losing? No. We say we're treating these most recent friendlies with the preparation and mentality of a World Cup match? Oh, we got players saying that the staff didn't even watch a minute of tape with them. Winning a game comfortably before it's over? Time for the manager to go take photos and sign autographs in the middle of the game. It's a home World Cup qualifying game against a weak Honduras? Screw actually trying to play football. Let's host the game in the middle of a polar vortex. Forget giving them a hard time. We just gave them frostbite. Yo, that game may actually be considered a war crime, dude. Someone check the Geneva Convention. And the worst of all of Lord Gregory's transgressions, what's going to be the man's ultimate downfall, is the exact same as Southgate's. An over-dependency on a system that's not infallible, and a reliance on players who are seemingly their favorites, instead of ones that are just simply better. I get trusting players. I get sticking with them in order to try to give them confidence back. But what I don't get is leaving Jordan Peefock off of the roster while his team is top of the Bundesliga and he's averaging almost a goal contribution every game. What more do you want out of an attacker than that? There's just a handful of national teams that wouldn't want this guy. Brazil, Argentina, Portugal, France, England, maybe Uruguay, maybe? If his current form won't get him into the team, then what will? What's he gotta do, Greg? Buy you a coffee mug and a new pair of Yeezys? What's even worse than the PFOC admission? What's worse than the PFOC admission is the players that he's got in the team instead. And I don't want to name any names, but I'm going to name names. Jordan Morris should not be in this team. And Lord Gregory gives this guy minutes every single window despite him repeatedly 
showing nothing. Greg's evaluation of talent is so bad that he's got Union Berlin in the Bundesliga tweeting at the US men's national team Twitter account. And yes, I'm not stupid. I get that Morris plays as more of a winger and Pfock is more of a center forward, but our team is struggling scoring. Bring another striker into camp. Give him more of a chance to test him out. Pfock literally led Switzerland in goals last year and is popping off in the Bundesliga this year. Just give him the chances that you're giving players like Morris, Ariola. It's just it's just disrespectful at this point. It's disrespectful. Just look at this list of players that Greg has given the most caps to in his tenure. Look at it. Just imagine if we were able to give Gio more reps in the middle of the park, or integrate players like Joe Scali and Luca De La Torre into the team faster. Instead, this national team is operated like a marketing arm for the MLS and it's pathetic. Because of Greg Burhalter, we will never see this team be better than the sum of its parts. And in the same way that Southgate plays his favorites and refuses to drop players like McGuire, no matter how many times Aaron Long shows that he's not at the level needed for international play, Greg just refuses to drop him. On the surface, it seems like you and Gareth Southgate maybe kind of kindred spirits in a way? No, absolutely. And, um, you know, Gareth was the first person I reached out to um, outside of former U.S. coaches. And the reason why is because I, I saw a lot of synergies or similarities. Of course. <laughs> At the end of the day, Greg Berhalter is a coach out of his depth. He had no accomplishments as a head coach prior to getting the job, was hired by his brother, is married to an imperfect system, can't make a tactical change until halftime for some reason, plays favorites by leaving out our best guys just for guys that he personally likes or who uh, are marketable, and he's simply just not fit to lead this golden generation forward. Leading into that Japan game, they didn't even watch any tape. Guys, get imagine. Do you know how crazy that is? High school teams prepare more for their games than Lord Gregory prepares the national team. This fraud spends more time on perfecting his behind the back bounce pass than he does improving the squad. One of the problems that I've always had with American soccer is that we hyper focus on physicality instead of focusing on developing technique. And this is something that's more ever present now than ever. We have a head coach ignoring Tim Tim Ream leading Europe in interceptions just because he can't run a fast 40 yard dash. As if somehow speed is the key trait into making a defender good instead of the ability to read the game. Greg's whole pitch to the Federation, the players, and even the fans whenever he got this job was all about changing how the rest of the world views US soccer. But what he fails to realize through his arrogance and nepotism is that the real challenge has always been changing how the US views US soccer. And Greg Burhalter is not the man to accomplish that. Anyways, thank you guys for watching. Not subbing to this channel is Greg Burhalter levels of talent evaluation. Don't forget to like the video and leave a comment because that really, really does help get it pushed in the algorithm. Even if you just comment random gibberish, that, that's cool. And if you disagree with me, if you love Greg, then leave a comment below telling me why I'm wrong, which I'm not wrong. I'm not. <laughs> I hope you guys have a good rest of your day today and peace out guys. Take it easy.